Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our Talks with Wald as we are calling now our journey through the deathbed edition of Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We have just finished Song of Myself, Passage 6, and now we turn to Song of Myself, Passage 7. Uh, in many ways, a continuation of Passage 6. Many will see the passages of 6 and 7 as a unit. I think it's pretty easy to see them as a unit. Now, our assumption, I just mentioned it, is that you've been following our work at LearnStrong.net. The inscriptions, uh, poems 1 through 24, starting from Pominock, we're going to actually return to that discussion, uh, the 19 sections of that, as well as Song of Myself from the introductory comments that I've given through now passage number six. Again, at LearnStrong.net, down that left-hand side there, Talks with Walt is our playlist for this set of, co this set of comments. Now, before uh, we move to passage seven, I just want to remind you of how passage six ended. All goes onward and outward, nothing collapses, and to die is different from what anyone supposed, and luckier. Now before we turn to passage 7, I just want to go back to kind of prove in some ways what it was I said uh, to you when and with you when we were having our conversation about starting from Pominock, especially passage 12, which I read the opening lines of in our last lecture. Now I'm going to uh, jump into the very middle of that section 12 when Whitman says, and I will show you that there is no imperfection in the present and can be none in the future. And I will show that whatever happens to anybody, it may be turned to beautiful results. And I will show that nothing can happen more beautiful than death. And I will thread a thread through my poems that time and events are compact. And that all the things of the universe are perfect miracles, each as profound as any. Now, I, I said in my discussion of this passage that it is, of course, Whitman's theodicy, as we will talk about the last of our big five, right? Uh, it's fascinating to read the deathbed edition of Leaves of Grass, because the lines of passage six and seven that we're about to, that we're about to study, seven, a song of myself, were written a number of years before those lines that I just read from starting from Pominock. However, when you pick up the deathbed edition, you read those lines first and starting from Pominock. And as I think I said in my discussion of 12 of, of Pominock, it's a way to get ready to read much of what's going on here, specifically now in passage 6, passage 7. Let's just enjoy passage 7. And, and, I, and I will use the term enjoy. I mean, obviously in, in passage 5 he called it the game. So let's go ahead and now play Whitman's game, shall we? Has anyone supposed it lucky to be born? I hasten to inform him or her it's just as lucky to die. And I know it. I pass death with the dying and birth with the new washed babe and am not contained between my hat and boots and peruse manifold objects, no two alike and everyone good, the earth good and the stars good and their adjuncts all good. I am not an earth nor an adjunct of an earth. I am the mate and companion of people, all just as immortal and fathomless as myself. They do not know how immortal, but I know every kind for itself and its own. For me, mine, male and female. For me, those that have been boys and that love women. For me, the man that is proud and feels how it stings to be slighted. For me, the sweetheart and the old maid. For me, mothers and the mothers of mothers. For me, lips that have smiled eyes that have shed tears, for me, children and the begetter of, of children. Undrape, you are not guilty to me, nor stale, nor discarded. I see through the broadcloth and the gingham, whether or no, and am around, tenacious, acquisitive, tireless, and cannot be shaken away. Now, the voice that Whitman will play with here in passage 7 is a, a, an inquisitive voice. And yet, notice, epistemologically, 
He will move from that fallibilist position, I think I'm right, but I could be wrong, to there ain't no way I'm wrong about what I'm going to say. And notice we'll have that absolutist epistemological position expressed two times here. But notice, and we said this in earlier studies as we've been together, the power of the rhetorical imagery that's going on here. Notice right away the rhetorical question that gets asked. Has anyone, and we've, we've heard this already in Pominach, in some of the inscription poems, it's as if he's asking, hey, did you hear? It's a very kind of informal kind of tone. Has anyone, and then of course the word supposed takes us obviously to the fallible epistemological position, has anyone supposed it lucky to be born? It's an interesting rhetorical question. I hasten to inform him or her, by the way, this word haste, just go back and do a search of how many times the word haste has already been used in Leaves of Grass and will get used more. I hasten to inform him or her, it's just as lucky to die. Now, this obviously will sound very much like the final line of six, as well as passage 12 of Pomenog. But then he finishes this with a, and I know it, which is again, for him, an absolutist epistemological position. In other words, there are things about which Whitman will say, I have no doubt whatsoever. And one of those is, it's just as lucky to die as it is to live. Then he'll use this interesting phrase, I pass death. Now, of course, our study of Emily Dickinson will make us smile here. It's an amazing thing to think that Dickinson and Whitman are contemporaries, and Dickinson, very much like Whitman, will deal with this issue of how one talks about death and the way one walks past death or death walks past one. Notice, I pass death with the dying. And let's say it out loud. Whitman as person, Whitman as historic figure, Whitman spent a lot of time around the dying because for him, the experience of the Civil War was an experience of taking care of the wounded, both from the, north, the northern forces as well as from the southern, as we have said. And to that degree, he was deeply impressed by the dying. So for him to write this, I pass death with the dying, he knows what he's talking about. And birth with the new washed babe, in other words, the circle of life. For every, every one that he attended to that would be dying, there would be a child that would be born. And, by the way, in the, in the 55, 1855 edition, there's, a, there's an ellipsis here instead of a comma. And am not contained, and now he'll use the elided spelling of contained in the 1855, he didn't play that game. Again, we said the alighted verbs are an attempt to try and capture that American vernacular, the speech vernacular. And am not contained between my hat and boots. Now, this is fascinating. A couple of observations for your notes. Whitman is very much about garments. In uh, Song of Myself, later on, uh, passage 46, uh, he will say, I know I have the best of time and space, and was never married, uh, uh, and was never measured, and never will be measured. I tramp a perpetual journey all. Uh, come listen all. My signs are, and then look what he calls for his signs, a rainproof coat, good shoes, earlier it will be boots, and a staff cut from the woods. Later, he will mention in uh, passage 20 of Song of Myself, the 1855 edition, he will say, I can, uh, I cock my hat, he actually uses the, the verb cock, I cock my hat as I please, indoors or out. Now it is an interesting study, and I would challenge you to do this. Type in uh, images of Walt Whitman, and then just go, to, just, just go to Google search, images. And look at the headgear. Look at all of the hats that he wore. Whitman was a great lover of hats, okay, and the way he wore them. I, I have told you that front piece of the original 1855 had Whitman with a hat on, and yes, it was cocked kind of to the side with a certain kind of air of confidence. Now, of course, the conclusion of Song of Myself will have something to do with boots and the dirt or the soil under the boots. So here he says, I can't be contained between my hat and my boots. And of course, we're now back to, obviously, the whole thing of beard and feet in passage 5. In other words, I'm more than my body. It's an easy way to say it. I'm more than, I'm more than my body. I'm more than what I appear. And he says, I peruse manifold, this word peruse is an interesting word for him to use it, a manifold objects, no two alike, 
There's a comma, by the way, in the 1855 uh, version after, after a light. And every one good, now sounding very much like the Genesis 1 creation account, where we're told it was good, it was good, and of course it was very good. Notice the repetition of good here. The earth good, and the stars good, and their adjuncts all good. This is, of course, the power of the optimism of Whitman. Everything that I see is amazing, is beautiful, is good. And then, very biblical language throughout passage 7, sounding very much like the Genesis, or the Exodus uh, 3.14 passage of I am. I am not an earth, nor an adjunct of an earth. In other words, singular. I am the mate and companion of people. By the way, that word mate, we're going to pay attention to it. Comrade, mate, camarero, it's, he uses different terms for the same thing. In other words, I'm your pal. I'm your pal. I'm your friend, right? I am the mate and companion of people, all just as immortal and fathomless as myself. What I assume you shall assume for every atom belonging to me as well belongs to you is the opening lines of part one, right? Notice the use of the word immortal. Obviously, the Phaedo comes to mind for Plato. And fathomless, translinguistic, beyond comprehension, we might say. By the way, there was a, a semicolon at the conclusion of Fathomless as Myself in the 55 edition, and there were no parenthetics, just simply the line itself. Here in the Deathbed edition, we put this in parenthetics. It's an interesting antecedent to the pronoun they. They do not know how immortal, and then he comes back to it, but I know. Now that they do not know how immortal is fascinating. It's like almost he's speaking directly to those skeptics who say, yeah, no, there's just body, there's no soul. And he says, no, no, you don't get it. I, I know something for sure, and that is the immortality of the soul. That is to say, of course, Plato's Phaedo. We then will mess around with a series of four F-O-R kinds of anaphoria, that beginning of multiple lines. Notice, Every kind for itself. Now we're back to Genesis. I think it's clear that when Whitman was writing these lines, he had biblical cadence in mind, the 1611 King James Version of the Bible. Every kind, think about you know, Genesis 1, 24, 25, right? Each according to its kind. Every kind for itself and its own. There was an ellipsis here in the 55 edition. For me, mine male and female, and in this series of four me's, okay, we're going to have a number of them, seven or eight of them, um, five of them will start sentences now. For me, the man, uh, I'm sorry, for me, those that have been boys, by the way, the word those was all uh, in the original 1855 poem. For me, those that have been boys and that love women, he says, I've, 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 been, I've done that. Now, it's interesting, it, it, it's that Theresius kind of, of uh, cadence that we're messing with here. That is to say, I've, I've known it all, I've seen it all, both male as well as female. And of course, we, we know about this, the mythology of Tiresias, we've talked much about it in, at LearnStrong.net. For me, and then it's a very interesting personal line, the man that is proud and feels how it stings to be slighted, uh, this is, is a compelling uh, realization. Whitman was not accepted often in his own lifetime for the poems that we today consider some of the greatest poems in the English language and certainly in the American literary tradition. So he knew what it was like to be slighted, even by people who he really respected, people like Emerson, who sometimes were not totally sure, what are you doing? I mean, you're causing some serious problems for for yourself. Obviously, passage 5, one of those, as we, as we already spoke about. Um, for me, the sweetheart, that was one word, by the way, in the 55 edition. For me, the sweetheart and the old maid, we had another ellipsis in 55. For me, mothers and the mothers of mothers. There's been a lot written by biographers about why it is the case that so many women were attracted to Whitman and to his poetry. He clearly celebrates the feminine. He celebrates motherhood, and he sees it as valuable. And, of course, he will write about his perfect mother elsewhere, as we'll get to it, right? For me, lips, now we're back to body parts. For me, lips that have smiled, interestingly not kissed, right? Eyes that have shed tears, we're to the theodicy question, why must terrible things happen? And then he comes back to children. For me, children 
and the begetters of children. Now, this begetters of children will be fascinating. He's going to play this game several times. He wanted to actually spawn rumors that he had left a number of children in the New Orleans area because he had been a little bit of a player while he had been down in New Orleans. We're pretty sure that most of this was, in fact, smoke and mirrors, and the degree to which Whitman ever actually had much, any kind of really sexual encounters is not clear. We're really not sure if at all he ever actually had any children. I'll let you run down with the biographies where some of that debate has gone over the years. There is an interesting line that's absent from the, 16, uh, or from the um, deathbed edition that was there in the, in the 1855 original edition. The, riot, the, the line is a, is a rhetorical question. It runs, who need be afraid of the merge? The, the coming together. In other words, it's all fine that they're all that they're all like this. And then the last stanza begins with the word undraped. That is to say, undress. And I believe here we're back to Genesis again. Only I think we're messing around now with the Genesis three story of the Eden story, especially the eating of the forbidden fruit. Go back and look at our lectures on Paradise Lost and Milton to be reminded of what we're talking about here. You'll remember that after the eating of the fruit of the forbidden tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll maybe recall that there was this uh, kind of sense of shame or guilt, right, that was being played out. And here, in Genesis 3, 7 especially, here he says, you are not guilty to me, nor stale, nor discarded. Notice that's three there. I see through the broadcloth and the gingham. In other words, I, any, anything you want to try and cover yourself with, I can see through it anyway. Whether or no, and am around tenacious, acquisitive, tireless, and cannot be shaken away. This idea that I, I can see everything and I see no shame. I see no guilt. It's as if he's trying to rewrite the Genesis 3 story, and, and that, that alone is quite a radical thing for him to be doing. By the way, um, there is a poem that we're going to study later called The Mystic Trumpeter, um, and he will there in those lines play the game of unshaken to the last. In other words, I'm steady. You're not going to be able, you're not going to be able to, to trouble me. I'm going to be all right, and I'm going to take care of you. There's a certain level of confidence at the end of seven, part seven here, that's quite remarkable. In other words, there's no reason for you to try and cover up your flaws. I'm okay with all your flaws. I accept you the way that you are. And of course, this full disclosure, this no shame, is a rewriting in many ways of the St. Augustine account of Genesis 3. With that in mind now, let's finish quickly at 2a. Well, obviously we're all somehow connected in both life as well as death. Um, and the artist can artist sees everything and can never be shaken. And that is to say, a true artist is going to accept whatever is there. And there shouldn't be this, this uh, shame of the things that one has done or whatever. And he's going to play that game out. At 2B, notice the repetitions, for me, for me, for me. It's quite remarkable. At 3, I've mentioned a number of titles. I think the book of Genesis is in his mind, especially in those first three chapters, as well as, of course, Emerson's Oversoul, so I'll mention it. And finally, at 3B, uh, about what can you say, I will not be shaken away? That's an interesting question. And, of course, the other question is, to what degree do you feel a certain kind of shame that maybe now all of a sudden you're beginning to challenge yourself to say, gee, I, I don't know if I should feel that tremendous amount of shame or not. Now that I'm reading Whitman, I may be like, hmm, very interesting. He's going to accept us the way we are. And he's going to challenge us to obviously accept ourselves for the way that we are. Well, there's passage seven. We'll move on to eight. I hope you're gaining some insights. Thank you.